Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first CLSP seminar of the year. Um, so our speaker for the first seminar is Chris Dyer, who we're very pleased to have. So Chris is a graduate student extraordinaire at University of Maryland. Uh, he's about to finish and start a postdoc with Noah Smith at CMU. So normally we reserve the Tuesday seminars for experts in the field of natural language processing, and they're generally people who are super senior in the, in the field. But we thought that it would be really interesting to invite Chris uh, to give the first talk because he's well on his way to becoming a luminary in the field. Uh, and I also thought it would be nice for the incoming graduate students to see uh, the type of research that you're capable of uh, producing as you're, as you're leaving at the end of your PhD. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Chris. All right. Well, uh, thank you for the nice introduction, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> and to those first-year students, I promise the famous people will start showing up soon, so you don't, you don't usually have to put up with people like me. Um, so I'm going to talk about improving machine translation by uh, propagating uncertainty. Um, so, so what that means is let's take a quick look at the, at the MT pipeline because, you know, as researchers, we might like to work on small pieces, but, you know, really, in reality, these things are embedded in larger context. So we generally start with some, you know, some text or, or an acoustic signal or even an image of some text from out in the world in, uh, when we really want to do machine translation. And then we have to pre-process it into some... Uh, some representation that our that our model is capable of, of translating, and then we and then we translate it. Now, of course, in reality, this process may go on even further. Uh, we may do other things with it, but we'll just start out with this. Translation's a nice problem. So, basically, what I'm going to talk about today is what happens when we replace this middle step with sort of a single best understanding of what we think we're trying to translate with a distribution over alternatives. Those can come from a variety of places. So order of this talk is I'm going to first give a general sort of probabilistic uh, framework uh, that I'm going to talk about these problems in. And then I'm going to talk about three separate problems um, in, in turn and uh, various pieces of, uh, of, of, of this uh, way of looking at the world. So probabilistic framework basically just treats this as a big directed graphical model where we can have random variables representing these different, these different phases. Now, I'm certainly not the first person to have thought of this uh, way of looking at the world. Um, Jenny Finkel wrote a nice paper about this, but many people have observed that um, it's, it's a way of seeing things. So, um, this, uh, so basically, we define a distribution over, over all these variables that factorizes as follows. Um, so we're going to look at three problems. So first is uh, the translation problem, so decoding, which is inference in this distribution, P of E given O. So given that raw signal, what, what's the best translation? Second is preprocessing. So actually, how do we represent the thing we want to translate uh, best? And then finally, I'm going to talk some about lattice alignment, which is when you have, when you can look at both sides, how do you align the two, uh, the two to each other? Um, so let's start by talking about uh, lattice translation. So this is basically the simple idea that we're going to take, whereas we normally would have a one, a single string that we want to translate, we're going to replace it with a distribution over strings, which we're going to encode as a, as a, as a weighted finite state machine. So um, <clears throat> why do we want to do this? So I'm going to show that propagating uncertainty, so basically the now input is a source of uncertainty. Um, by propagating this forward into the translation pipeline, we can improve its quality. Um, and then second, this is actually turns out to be a fairly easy thing to do, and it's, uh, and it's efficient to do. It doesn't blow up your running time at all. So let's take a look at some motivation for this. Now, obviously, we can all imagine that with a text-to-speech system, you, you get to, uh, sorry, speech-to-text system, you get a distribution over strings that you think you heard. But uh, there's actually uncertainty everywhere. So um, we're going to look at a slightly different example. So first, let's consider the problem of Arabic translation. So Arabic puts together morphemes that in English doesn't. Um, so you can see top line is the romanization of Arabic. It gets split up into the, um, into, the, into the second line, and then you can see how it sort of aligns to the English. 
So a solution to this problem is to segment words, segment these morphemes into freestanding words. And now this always improves your, your unigram coverage. But the question is, what morphemes should we, uh, should we segment? Um, just because it's improving your morphemes, your unigram coverage doesn't mean you're going to get better translations. So the answer is always it depends. So um, basically what we're going to do in, in this model is we're going to say we're going to encode multiple segmentations of the same input into a segmentation lattice and then let the decoder decide what, uh, which segmentation to use for each span. So inside of a single sentence you might have one that has a very granular segmentation and one that's uh, very, very large units. So um, here's an example. So we have some surface form. Um, and then we split it up, uh, and then we just combine these two segmentations. In reality, there may be many, many different approaches to segmentation that we, that we, uh, that we use. Um, so um, how does this work in translation? So this table uh, shows uh, translation under two different um, models, uh, transduction models. One on the left is based on weighted finite state transducers. The one on the right uses synchronous context-free grammars. Um, the way you read this chart is larger numbers are better, um, and uh, these, are, these are blue scores for those who work on MT, um, and these are on standard test sets. And above the thick line, you see two conditions. There's the, those, are, those represent the performance of the system using that segmentation as, as the single best uh, output. The, below the line, we have a lattice that encodes both. So that, in that case, the decoder gets to make a decision about how to translate which spans. Um, and as you can see, you see improvements over, uh, over both of those baseline conditions. Um, I should point out that the training of the system changes a little bit. So um, I didn't do anything particular to train a model uh, to translate the lattice as anything particularly clever. I basically just duplicated the training data from in both segmentation uh, approaches and then built a, a single model from the combined data. So we'll talk later more about training issues. So the efficiency impact. So, um, the impact on decoding time is really um, quite minimal. So with a parsing-based decoder, the uh, impact on the training uh, on the decoding time is roughly cubic in the number of nodes um, and linearly proportional to the branching factor of the lattice. So on a, on a standard uh, ASR decoding task, um, we see a, a slowdown of approximately a factor of four. Um, so this, this is really quite manageable. And you know, keep in mind that these lattices may have billions of paths uh, um, that, that are uh, present in them. So, you know, this is certainly something uh, we, can, we can be pleased with. Um, okay, so the lattice example that I just showed you I, I was just supposed to give a flavor for why you might want to uh, use, la you know, deferred decoding. You can see some real benefits, but it's not always clear ha how to model uh, how to get this uh, distribution over the over the input? You know, is it, is there really ambiguity there? So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a um, a related problem of how do you model um, how do you mod do this part of the modeling? How do you come up with a segmentation model specifically uh, to that's appropriate for translation? And I'm gonna begin with a with an insight. Um, so Richard Sprout uh, as was sort of the father of. Uh, um, of Chinese word segmentation as an NLP task. And, uh, and his solution, so this is an inherently ambiguous problem. So the Chinese doesn't write any spaces between their words. But if we want to do any of our text-based NLP tasks, we have to basically break up those Chinese sequences into words. Unfortunately, they're, you know, Chinese speakers cannot agree on where the, where the spaces are. In fact, they disagree around 25% of the time, which is a, which is, which is really quite quite a lot, and so the solution. His solution was uh, uh, let's uh, let's um, you let a style guide basically decide. Let's override the humans with a style guide, and that's been fine. But and that's also fine, perhaps for a Bake Off if you want to you know compare people's systems. But if we want to just use this as an input to a, to another component, we don't really care about the uh, um, about what the style guide says. We just want to have a um, we just want something that's reasonable for our task. And so I'm going to talk about some of the issues with uh, doing task appropriate uh, segmentation, for example. Yeah? You mentioned the number 25%. Yeah. Is that 
Yes. Can you clarify what it means? So, of the potential places that you could put boundaries, did they agree on 25%? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it was 25% per, uh, per uh, per main clause actually was the way, way he had uh, yeah. way he had defined that. So I look, I actually looked that up just this morning because yeah. So I, explain to me what it is then. So in every main clause, there's a twenty five percent chance that, that they will disagree how to how how to how to put a space somewhere. Yes. In other words, like you know, in some cases they'll all agree the space should be here. Yes. Yeah, so so in many they either disagree about there being a space or they put it in different place. Exactly. So I think the, the general error is people disagree about whether or not there's a space. So some spaces are quite clear, um, and when there is clearly a space, it's clear where it is. But then there's some basically there are these co these now noun compounds that are quite ambiguous. Um, okay, so so the goal of this section is to describe how to train a CRF segmentation model to optimize the probability of a set of strings rather than a single best string, and show that this can lead to improvements in MT. So the model requirements are just simply, I want a single model for lattices, whereas in some of this previous work, I had combined a bunch of different segmentations from different models as sort of a heuristic solution to generating diversity for the lattices. Um, but now we can have a single model. Um, secondly, there may be multiple correct or plausible segmentations, and whatever analysis if we wanted to think about something else, and we want to just use minimal amounts of human-generated training data. So an example of this is the segmentation ambiguity that's present in German when you want to target German-English translation. So this is a very specific task, but it's emblematic of, 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 of this class of problems. So if we take this nice, very German word, Tonbandaufnahme, which means a cassette recording, um, it can be plausibly segmented in, in four different ways. So we can either not segment it or we can segment it into two pieces. Um, and some of them lead more or less directly to good translations. So um, the first half, Tonband, is a compound meaning audio recording. And, you know, so audio recording, or sorry, audio tape is what the first half means. So audio tape recording is a plausible, maybe a little stilted translation, but you can imagine uh, that it is. So I, I view this as kind of, you know, there's, there's room that a reasonable person might say, well, this is, this is a, po a, possible, uh, a possible segmentation, and then others just don't make any sense. And, you know, obviously, for example, the first one, if it's not in your system, you're not going to be able to translate it. Um, <coughs> So, um, since there may be multiple correct segmentations, I actually propose that we create reference segmentation lattices. Now, these actually encode the ambiguity that's, Im that's, that's implicitly present in our, in our problem from the, um, from the annotator's perspective. So, for example, we might take these two different words, Freitag, which is a, a word that, although it consists of two morphemes, means uh, is not compositional, and therefore there's no plausible compositional translation where we can split this and, and translate it. Uh, the second one we just reviewed that uh, Tonbandaufnahme might have a couple of plausible different segmentations. So this actually forms then a, a training set where we have these, these input words and then their plausible tra uh, translations. Now, um, I just, just, you know, I, you can define a model that models distributions of segmentations uh, given a word. So this is a conditional model. Um, so for any plausible segmentation of the model, this will, this will assign a probability to it. Um, and there are a couple of side constraints. Uh, you can look in the paper if you want the details. Um, but basically, the objective in training is going to be simply to move probability mass from the good paths in, uh, in this. Uh, so you can imagine it generates a lattice of all the possible segmentations. We're going to move the probability mass from the bad paths which are the ones not in the reference, to the good paths, which are the ones in the, in the reference. And um, so we just maximize conditional probability, and uh, um, the gradient is, has a nice, uh, um, easy to compute form. Um, so you can use the standard uh, numerical optimization techniques that we, we learn about. Um, so this just looks like you start with some initial model, basically defines a uniform distribution over all paths, you get some references, you iterate on training, and then you end up with a final model that has, uh, that has the, most of the probability mass associated with the, with the, good, uh, with the good paths. And I'm not going to go into the features that I use here, but I, I actually 
um, find you can get away with less training data if you use some dense uh, linguistically motivated features and you don't have to use our typical uh, very rich uh, NLP features. Um, so um, I should also point out that uh, the, these lattices can then be pruned uh, uh, using some kind of uh, using forward backward pruning uh, to to get uh, to remove those low probability paths before decoding. Yes. So, uh, so in a training objective where you have much more reference, do you uh, basically uh, like do you get all the training examples or? I mean Oh, so, so the, the way I actually do this right now is I, I create a FSA representing the, so representing the full distribution of the model and then to, com to compute the, so that's essentially the denominator, and then to compute the numerator, I just intersect um, the reference lattice with that lattice and then whatever's, and then I compute, you can compute the expectations in that lattice. Um, in the in the remaining uh, reference lattice. So you'd be just as happy with a uh, model that put all the weight on the bottom path as with one that splits it between the bottom and the middle path or something? Um, yes. So that uh, that does. So I'm not trying to match a distribution. Um, in it's the, like it's kind of like having multiple references uh, when trading. Uh, yes. Trading yeah. It would be. This would so be you'd like. You'd be happy to get anything. Uh, yes. That's co that's correct. Uh, you you're you're happy to get. Uh, you're happy to get uh, your any of them. In practice, these te these ten they tend to be fairly evenly distributed over the uh, over the uh, at least in the so the training does tend to does tend to favor any of them um, or sort of favor them e equally. It doesn't uh, it doesn't end up you don't see a lot of peakiness uh, in the in the good paths that were found in the in the, the that were found in the training set. That would have to be an artifact of the model. That is an artifact. That, no, no, no. There's nothing in the training that you're right. So, so this is because this is another good side effect of using these relatively dense um, uh, linguistic features that are. So I'm not using a bunch of binary features where you could come up with sort of very precise solutions to this problem. Just because I didn't want to generate enough training data to actually learn anything useful uh, from a model like that. A question about the reference. Uh -huh. So you say there are multiple correct answers. Yes. Are they all correct regardless of context? I'm thinking about it. Okay, so that so that's a good question. Um, I, I it's it's. A, that's not always going to be the case for this, since I am translate. So since my model is since I'm not attempting to model any context, I, I basically said, what is the correct segmentation under any, uh, under any context? But you could think about this. Uh, as a, as a context dependent problem, although in that case, I would, if you wanted to, uh, you would need to include context in the model in some way if you wanted to address that. Yeah, the people who generated the references, <coughs> Me. were they looking at them in isolation or were they looking at them in context? I looked at them in context. So, so I, I just put together the test data. I took uh, 10 uh, newspaper articles from the German news media uh, last, uh, last fall, and I took all of the words that were uh, greater than six characters long and generated reference lattices for them. And uh, um, uh, at the end, I have some supplemental slides that give details of the training data. But it is, you know, this was a couple hours worth of work. This wasn't, this wasn't, uh, wasn't a big task by any means, and it worked, uh, it worked quite nicely. Um, so um, now I'll talk briefly about some translation experiments. Um, so um, there are four experimental conditions here. Um, so, so basically, you know, the standard baseline is, of course, so with German, you can actually get away. You don't have to segment anything. You know, we have a lot of training data for German. So you can learn these uh, rare, <coughs> many of these rare words even from, from the training data. Alternatively, you can do a one best segmentation. So I'm comparing this with uh, um, the, the Kruen and Knight um, uh, one best segmentation model, which uses some, some statistical um, cues but treats them heuristically to pick a best segmentation. Uh, then um, one where I use no segmentation to train the model, so I just train off of the raw data, but then I use the lattices I just described during decoding. Uh, and then finally where I use a combination of two versions of the, of the training data during training, one that's not segmented, one that is, and then I do uh, lattice decoding um, on, on the best, uh, on, on that model. Now, so you can see, so blue scores, again, higher is better, uh, TER lower is better. Um, the, uh, the differences that are uh, bold are significantly better. 
um, over the uh, over all of the the baselines, um, or sorry, over the unsegmented N1 best segmentation baseline. So um, the first thing we see is that um, the for, so previously for German the recommended uh, Pre-processing was to do a one best segmentation, and this is justified in, in the fact that, on average, each German Newswire article has um, one uh, novel word. So it, people cr are quite productive with their lexicons in, in German, and, and so just an average news article, you need to deal with this problem. But again, we see this problem of, of over segmentation actually leading to poor models. So. Um, although you may be doing better on that one out of vocabulary word that you would have otherwise had, you end up hurting yourself uh, because you're getting less precise translations in other places. So, um, so that's, that's an interesting result. And so one reason for that is probably that this year we have more training data than ever before. And so we, uh, uh, we don't actually want to segment. But um, as you can see, if we use lattices, we start to improve over our baseline. Um, both uh, in the standard uh, training condition, a very small improvement, and then also uh, more significantly in, uh, in a condition where we do better training. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is basically that these lattices that we have contain, uh, are likely, so they're not guaranteed to, they, these paths may get pruned out, but they are likely to contain that baseline condition. So, so, um, so it's, it would be almost unthinkable to actually do worse than that, uh, than that baseline. So this is a nice, uh, this is one important lesson if you're working on these uh, you know, sort of metric driven tasks is if you include your baseline as, uh, in your model, then, then you're almost guaranteed to, you're at least not gonna hurt yourself. It's a, it's a, it's a tip to all you first years. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, we see some we see some nice gains, and these this is one reference. So these uh, the magnitude of these improvements might not look as substantial as the previous ones, which had four references. So, but these are significant improvements. So, oh yeah. What fraction of your training data was words whose reference segmentation is not doing? Um, so I segmented any word I. I ran the model on any word that was longer than six characters. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the, what fraction of the training data that was. Uh, uh, probably, my, my guess would be maybe about a third um, is, is over I six. the reason I'm asking is because the over segmentation which puts you in step two. Yes. Uh, I wonder if it could be mitigated by having a representative sample where lots of words don't need to be segmented. Well, yeah, so, so there is, uh, so um, there have been, that's the, that actually is the other approach. So people generally have referred to these as, as, as back off translation models where you only segment under certain conditions if it's been seen once or if it's never been seen or if it meets certain conditions like uh, you try and do match something about the distributions where you learn whether to segment or not. So, so in fairness, I just used the, the strategy recommended by, by Kuhn and Knight um, for, um, uh, for the one best segmentation condition, but there certainly are smarter things you can do. And I would, and so, so one, uh, one thing that almost certainly would help is you only segment OOV words, you're not gonna be hurting yourself, you can only help. So, so and I should, I should add that condition just so you can see what the, what the value of the, uh, the lattices, yeah. One question about input lattices. Um, so you get them by applying your segmentation model, yes. which means Yes, they are they are weighted, and so I include that as a feature, and then then into the into the translation model. So I actually break that uh, conditional independent assumption a little bit, but uh, um, but it's uh, uh, and then the pruning actually turns out to make a difference. If you um, so there's this nice U shape. So the that A factor is is how how much uh, pruning you did in the lattice, and so if you if you prune the lattice too much, you uh, you end up not performing as well. And if you prune it too little, again, at some point, our translation models are quite weak and they don't actually not know what they don't know how to translate. And so they're like, oh, I can translate these, you know, this string into some very common English words, I'll do that, even though it's not a reasonable uh, segmentation of the, of the source word. So, um, all right, so this, uh, this final section is, is, um, is, is, is my ongoing work. Um, uh, that I'm going to discuss. 
Um, so, so this we've looked at how we can translate ambiguity, but and we've looked at how we can build models of inherently ambiguous phenomena, but we haven't really considered. But what we really want to do is say, well, we know what the raw data looks like, and we know what the translations we want are, but you know, what's the best segmentation that we, uh, you know, I, how do we do this in a more unsupervised way? So how do we actually pick a segmentation that's, that's optimal for the, uh, for the translation problem? Um, oops. So um, basically we're going to treat uh, pre-processing as a, as a latent variable. And uh, um, so if you have a lattice of Segment, so there's sort of two related problems here, which is one, if you, have a, if you have a lattice of segmentations, how do you induce a translation model that can translate these lattices? So up until now, we had been using sort of these heuristic, uh, these heuristic models of translation, which, uh, where we were duplicating, uh, um, dupl duplicating different models using one best criteria. This isn't very good. Um, so this is, the pro um, and this is generally a problem of lattice alignment. So what in this lattice aligns to what in the target? So first, I'm going to take a step back and say, you know, what is alignment? So it's basically, for the purposes of this talk, using some model of uh, translation, it's just alignment is the most probable story for how the target was generated from the source. Um, and so the trick is, of course, that these alignments aren't given. You, can't, uh, you, can't, you can go out and buy small sets of hand-aligned data, but basically you've got to just infer them. Uh, from the observed data, um, that is, you have to learn a translation model. So, um, to briefly review uh, the IBM um, models, which provide sort of a foundation for all, you can view basically any alignment model uh, through this lens. Basically, you can you treat alignment as this hidden variable that relates how you go from an English string to a French string. So this is the old noisy channel formulation. So we're actually, we're going backwards. And so for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to be working in this noisy channel model. So we add this latent variable. Then we uh, use the chain rule to um, do this, uh, to generate from left to right. Um, they're, they're, this J index loops over the target string from left to right. Um, then we split this into, we decompose this into two pieces, one where we are just worried about what the translation of the next word is, and one where we're worried about how well the new position that we say that that word was generated from fits into the sort of overall shape of the alignment grid. Um, and so this, so there are sort of two pieces of, of these models. There's this alignment th probability, which says, you know, is this a good place to put that dot in the grid? And then the other one is just the, we assume lexicality, which says that a word is only, its probability is only a function of the word that it is generated from. Um, now that's obviously a rather um, harsh assumption and, and many models have, have addressed that, but I'm just gonna, we're gonna stick with this assumption um, because it's, it, these models are nice and tractable. Um, so then you can further, uh, so you make some as simplifying assumptions for the sake of tractability about the model of alignment. If you assume a uniform distribution over all possible alignments, you get model one. If you assume a first order uh, dependence, you get the hidden Markov model. So these can be trained using very uh, standard techniques. So we specifically, we learn uh, using expectation maximization. So I'm going to briefly say how this looks for for translation. So if we have the, uh, the sentence pair, the blue house and la maison bleu, um, we build a grid and we want to compute the expected translation counts that each word translates in. What is the expected number of times that, for example, the word la was generated by the word the? And uh, so this looks like a grid for any of these lexical alignment models. Um, so, um, so we can uh, compute the probability of, of a dot basically being in this uh, position. So that's basically that the is aligned to la. And then we do that given the parameters of the, of the, existing, of the existing model. And then we select new parameters on the next iteration that optimize, uh, um, optimize this data. So now what happens when we have a distribution over what's generating those words? So basically, 
let's model this instead of p of f given e. We'll, give, we'll model p of f given a lattice. So now I'm going to just talk about how you can generalize this. So it's, again, we're going to start by assuming uh, there's this uh, latent variable, which is the path through the lattice, um, which uh, we assume conditional independence again. So given that path, we don't actually care about any of the other paths. Um, and then um, we note that we can, again, just convert that uh, what I have on the left is now on the right. On the bottom is just a traditional string-to-string uh, uh, -string translation model. Again, we add our, our latent variable of, of alignments. And then so we have two, two pieces. One is the path and the source lattice. One is the traditional alignment model. Um, and then we can do um, other simplifying assumptions on the right, as we did with any traditional alignment model. So for example, this gives you the formula for lattice model one, you might say. So this is going to align uh, lattices to, um, to target strings. So um, again, we can, use, uh, we can use EM to, uh, to update the, um, to, to learn parameters for this model. Again, since we're only updating the parameters for the translation model, it's the same set of parameters as you have in a string to string alignment model. So you can really substitute any, any kind of model for this. So um, whereas we formerly had the blue house and uh, La Maison Blue, and we wanted to learn, uh, uh, learn a translation model, now let's imagine that we had this, uh, this lattice representing, say, two potentially confusing strings uh, in, uh, uh, in, in an ASR type context, where we have either the blue house or the blouse aligning to la maison bleu. Um, so what does EM look like now? Well, we have for each path through the lattice, actually, now we have a, we have a potential alignment grid. So the, the target, uh, the words in the target can be generated, uh, can be generated um, from, from in either grid. Um, and uh, whereas formerly we had the co individual columns in a grid summing to one, now you may be, you may be the, the entire column in, in any path in the lattice has to, has to sum to one. So it's, it's a, very, a very, similar, uh, um, very similar situation. Um, so you can, you can do this and, uh, and uh, oh, you should also point out that the same, the same word may appear in, in multiple places. So you want to track statistics over, over the individual word pairs and not try to decompose this into, into multiple grids um, or anything like that. Um, so. Um, now, how do we do inference in this? Um, so um, models one and two in the HMM are very efficient. So these are, if you're not familiar with them, these are just standard uh, word alignment models, very, very simple. Um, and they're very efficient to train. They either have closed form solutions for computing the, uh, the expectations in those cells, or they can be generated using dynamic programming. Um, and they're nice because they, they forget uh, what words they've generated from in the past. So once they've used some source word to generate, they can move on having forgotten everything they, they ever knew. Um, so, but in, in a lattice, you have, you have this case where if in some lattices, once you've picked a particular transition, you may not be able to use another one. So the A, B path is fine, and the X, Y path is fine, but trying to generate from A and then generating from Y is, is bad. And, uh, this means, I think, no exact inference, although I had a nice conversation with Jason where uh, I think uh, I may be able to, may be able to uh, reweight this uh, lattice and, and compute the expectations I need uh, efficiently. Um, but for now, we're going to pretend that uh, there is no exact uh, efficient uh, inference and talk about how you might do inference uh, anyway. Um, so one uh, obvious thing is to restrict the structure of the lattice uh, um, where you don't, so given a particular transition, you don't actually cut, your, cut out any other possibilities. Um, the second one is to use a model that tracks span. So some models, so the interesting thing about these IBM models is they actually don't care. You can, they can more than happily generate an entire sentence from a single word. Um, whereas other models such as the ITG or BTG model of Dekai Wu, um, actually requires that both sentences be completely covered uh, by the time they've derived the, the goal node. So it's a parsing-like model. Um, so that's another possibility. You can parse lattices with that and, uh, and train this model in, in such a way. Um, or you can use approximate inference. So um, I'm going to 
advocate using approximate inference because it lets us uh, it lets us play with these models uh, that that we know and love um, so well. Um, so I'm going to advocate using uh, Monte Carlo EM. Uh, it's just like regular EM, only instead of uh, computing exactly what the uh, uh, sufficient statistics are, you compute these expectations using uh, Monte Carlo techniques. Um, and as an added bonus, um, very trivial to incorporate priors. Sometimes these closed form solutions don't, uh, don't let you do that quite as easily. Um, and this, uh, this works quite well. So, uh, yeah. First year students, could you Tell us what EM is. Oh, yeah. So uh, expectation maximization is a way, it's an iterative alg algorithm for <coughs> learning. Uh, for, it's an it's a iterative algorithm for learning the parameters of a set uh, for a model. So you have to have a fixed model structure. <coughs> and you learn some parameters that optimize the likelihood of the, so the, the marginal likelihood of the training data given your model. And so, so basically, which, the way it works, is you pick a set of, of parameters, randomly perhaps, or, um, and then you go through, the, then you apply that model to the data and you see, um, and you effectively learn, uh, you effectively compute a gradient, and then you update the parameters to improve the likelihood if you, um, of, the, of the training data that, that's being used. And then you replace with your new parameters, then you do the same thing again. And so EM is, it, it's, it's problematic in some cases. It, 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 it only finds local minima, um, uh, minimizing the negative log likelihood. So um, <clears throat> in, unless you have a convex, so model one is nice because it's actually completely convex. So the solution that's found is, is actually the, the best solution there is. So, so it, can be, it can be good. but. Uh, um, it basically involves uh, you. You have to compute uh, the uh, so so it involves so and then there are two steps. So in the first step, you have to compute these expectations. Of you can think of them as the ex so if you think of this as a as a graphical model where various transitions uh, reflect uh, uh, various uh, um, events in the model, you c you compute the expected number of times that a particular transition. Uh, will be taken given the data you're seeing and the model. So that's what these expectations I'm talking about computing uh, here are. And so sometimes you can, there's a closed form solution to this, and other times, uh, and, and in this case I'm arguing that, well, if you can't necessarily figure out what that is, uh, in my case, or there isn't one, uh, then you can just use uh, this, this approximate technique where you, you simulate using uh, basically random walks through the, the space of events using uh, these Monte Carlo techniques. So you'll learn very soon a lot about EM. I'm sure Jason can uh, fill you in on the, the, the details. Uh, <coughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so there are a couple of additional benefits of MCMC. So First, I mean, these are, it's just, it's, yes, it's approximate, but it's very easy to compute a whole bunch of different useful quantities. So during, uh, during training, we can compute these, uh, these expected counts that we need quite easily. Um, it's also easy, so say we want to find the, the maximum posterior source path. So what's the best lattice given, given this, uh, get, what's the best path through the lattice, not just given the, the parameters, the, 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 the probabilities in the lattice, but given the, given the target data as well. Um, so we just uh, keep track of how many times we've seen each path, and then the one that we've seen the most is after sampling, that's, that's the map path. And, and these, uh, you know, th it requires sampling for quite some time, but uh, um, if you sample infinitely long, you know, it's guaranteed to converge uh, almost surely to the desired distribution, and you can actually prove much tighter bounds than sampling forever. Um, which is which is nice. Um, so, uh, so to I'm going to now talk about some preliminary experimental results. So I'm going to look at two problems here. One is uh, one is a translation problem, and one is what is learning what I'm calling this translation optimal segmentation. Um, so for this first exper this first preliminary experiment, what I do is I start with a lattice of plausible segmentations on, on one side of the training data. So I'm going to return to what I 
introduced the segmentation problem with, which is this uh, Chinese word segmentation, where we just don't know. Uh, we have reason to think that you know it's an inherently ambiguous problem. Therefore, there's a reasonable. Uh, it, it's reasonable to have to to let, for example, the the English side of the Chinese English translation task drive the appropriate segmentation. So, so the way I ran this experiment was I ran a few iterations of Monte Carlo EM to train uh, this lattice alignment model one on a fairly small uh, data set, and then I extracted that maximum posterior uh, path through the lattice, which induced a, a particular segmentation. So some details on the, on the corpus. This is a very small corpus. It's called BTEC. It's uh, from the travel domain. Um, it's a great corpus if you want, uh, if you want to do really, really rapid experiments. Um, and then, uh, but you should always replicate these results on, on bigger data. Um, so I used five different segmenters. So I didn't train a model myself uh, because I don't have uh, I don't have some reference lattices for Chinese training data. So I had to uh, use this heuristic approach. So um, I just gathered as many as I could, took these different segmentations, put them into a lattice, and then I assigned. I just said every segmentation uh, is. Uh, is uniformly likely. And I, I could have done more clever things where if I saw the same word uh, in multiple segmentations, uh, I could have uh, assigned higher weight to it. But, uh, but this, is a, this was a reasonable starting point, I thought. Sorry, Chris? Yeah? When you, when you say combine the output of five segments, or assuming that every last had five? Uh, five paths? No, oh, sorry. Or, or so, just no, I did the, so, so what I did was every time they, uh, every time two segmenters posited a space at the same point, uh, those two paths pinched together. So um, you could end up with many more than five paths through the lattices. So there could be, there could be thousands. You could also end up with fewer of the segmenters. What, what you could end up, what's that? What, what was typical? Uh, I don't actually, I didn't actually compute the statistics, but uh, there were, uh, it was certainly not untypical to have hundreds of thousands of paths. Really? Um, so, yeah, so, so. Oh, sorry, hundreds of thousands of paths through the, through the sentence. Through the sentence, oh, sorry, sorry, for a sentence lattice, yeah, yeah. So on, on average, though, so, so really what happened, there are, so a couple of these, uh, so specifically the, the uh, segmenter from Harbin University and the, and the Stanford uh, um, uh, Chinese tree bank. Um, well, so both you can see there are actually two segmentation styles. So one's called the Chinese tree bank, and one's Peking, uh, Peking University, both on Stanford. Those are just two different style guides, and they, they actually disagree um, quite substantially. So so obviously there's sort of some systematic divergence in these two segmentation standards. And then Harbin University again is quite different. They have their own. Um, so um, so what happened? So well. This is a small example of the kind of thing that I was hoping this model would learn. Um, so there is some evidence that uh, the model's generating some uh, translation uh, dependent segmentation. So um, in English, um, if we ha have the word crayfish, in Chinese we have this nice three character uh, unit at the end in red. Um, however, it turns out, thanks to uh, all the helpful Chinese speakers who explain these things to me, that this actually is itself composed of small, and then another uh, digraph here, which I think means like lungfish or something like that. Um, and so I, knowing this, if you change the training data to, for example, from crayfish to small lobster, this also incidentally means, as it, the digraph itself means uh, lobster, but you could imagine further segmenting it. Um, you actually end up with then different segmentation, and so so you go through and you, you there are there are many examples of, of of this kind of thing. But this this is essentially what I was ho the sort of behavior that I was hoping that the model would learn, and and that I do see evidence that 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 it's happening. Um, so there is unfortunately some very obvious uh, problems with this model. Uh, so EM is a maximum likelihood uh, estimator. And um, maximum likelihood has some bad behavior with respect to, uh, 
with respect to rare elements. So I'm going to return to just the standard uh, word alignment problem that, that we've all worked on. And if you look on the right, you see a reference alignment. If you look on the left, you'll see what model one thinks the alignment should be. And you'll see that the word coffins is aligned to basically everything. This is what I was talking about, where, where these, these models are more than happy to generate basically a whole sentence from, uh, uh, from a single word. And the problem is coffins just <coughs> turned out wasn't present very often in the, uh, uh, in the training data. And so you, this model could actually increase its likelihood by just having it do a lot more work than it actually should have been. And, uh, and so when you end up with this, so, so this is a problem, this is a well-known problem with uh, maximum likelihood uh, estimation and it's been, it'll be dealt with later. Um, so the problem is this, pro this tendency is compounded in, uh, uh, in, these, in this lattice alignment problem because rare words can exist on any path and uh, they all have a lot of probability mass to, to give away. Um, and so basically paths, with, uh, paths in E with, uh, with rare words are sort of disproportionately favored. And so whereas you might think that the segmentation you're seeing is driven by the English, it might also just be because there are some really rare words that were nice and juicy and able to give away a lot of probability mass. And since I had a uniform prior over the segmentations, this was, this was just causing a lot of trouble. So, um, still, I'm undaunted and I thought I would try a translation experiment. So the idea is that this, uh, this map segmentation of the training data is the one that's, is the one that's best for, for MT in some sense. If you want to translate lattices that have a similar uh, set of possible segmentations, this is the kind of segmentation you'd want to learn your rules from. So basically, I just used this uh, um, this segmentation as the input to the standard MT pipeline and then I decoded a test set uh, with a lattice containing lots of segmentations. So, um, so basically the baselines are, uh, I'll start with a simple uh, segmenter, this uh, greedy maximum match segmenta segmentation approach which is commonly used for, uh, for Chinese decoding. Uh, if I use a one best input that's not a lattice then I get uh, um, a baseline about a little over uh, 47 and a half. Uh, if I switch to a lattice as the decoding set, I can, I can improve things some. Um, however, I should point out that if you switch segmenters to, uh, uh, to, to something a little bit more reasonable than, than this uh, greedy approach, you, you can significantly improve uh, the, the quality. Um, so um, if we use the heuristic I've been using in the rest of this talk to train the model where I take the output of all the different segmenters and combine them, you can get uh, another couple of blue points on, on top of this. Um, so then the big question though is how well does this, uh, does this map segmentation work and uh, this max posterior and unfortunately it doesn't quite beat even our, even our baseline. So there's obviously, uh, there's obviously a, little bit, uh, a little bit of work that, uh, that remains to be done. Um, so my ongoing work right now is solving the gar garbage collector problem uh, using Bayesian alignment models. And so this is one, one of many ways of addressing this problem with uh, maximum likelihood estimators in these, in these cases. And so basically you had a prior that says favor models that have fewer parameters. And so, so this again, to recap on this, uh, you know, this example from earlier is what model one wants to do. However, if you add just a simple sparse prior, so a Dirichlet prior, you actually immediately see something that at least looks a lot better. And uh, so, so that's nice. It seems to be addressing the problem. Um, furthermore, if you use a, an alignment error rate where you want to see smaller numbers, um, I took just three standard uh, alignment models and added uh, um, added uh, a Dirichlet prior on the multinomials that parameterize these models. Um, then I, I did tune the hyperparameters by hand, but you see that in all cases you significantly improve the, the alignment quality just by saying, hey, let's favor, let's favor sparse, sparser multinomials. So, um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that this will uh, solve some of this garbage collecting problem. Um, so, uh, the other ongoing work is uh, rescoring uh, ASR lattices using a translation model. So 
this is the case where, say, you're uh, speaking in uh, you're speaking in French, but you have an English reference translation. Um, it sounds artificial, but this uh, this this task actually shows up in a variety of places. Um, so this basically lets you say, well, I have a transcription system that's giving me one set of probabilities, and then I can, and then I, but I know what the translation is. What's the consensus between the two? And so this lattice alignment algorithm gives you a solution to this. So this is this is other ongoing work. So um, I am going to wrap things up here in the last few minutes and say. Um, all right, let's defer commitments to resolving ambiguity till as late as possible. Now, there are computational reasons that can get expensive to propagate this information forward, but if you're dealing with, uh, with machines, you know, finite state type transducers that, to implement your models or synchronous context free grammars, you can actually do this fairly inexpensively. Um, Furthermore, ambiguity is everywhere, not just in the obvious cases like if you're doing something on ASR output, but if you have committing to a source language segmentation, say, um, is, a, is a huge, uh, um, is, a, is actually a massively uncertain thing to do. We just don't know what the, what the right segmentation ought to be. Um, and then, of course, by extension is if you are doing something with MT output, so if you're, if you're summarizing, you, you probably ought not just confine yourself to the one best output of your system. You're, gonna, you're, you're almost certainly going to be throwing away information that, that's valuable. Um, so, and then the, the other point I'd like to make is that uh, you should model ambiguity uh, rather than resorting to a, a style guide. So style guides are nice and uh, you, uh, you know, it, tell, it, it, gives you a, it gives you a one best right answer, but uh, you know, it's just not a real natural fact of our language that, that these things are, are, uh, um, are truly unambiguous. And so I think modeling this uh, ambiguity directly is a, ha has some real advantages. And so I would argue, so instead of building more and more uh, manually annotated one best Chinese segmentation data, it would be useful to generate a corpus of, uh, of plausible alternatives so we can actually learn where the ambiguities are rather than trying to artificially pick uh, what the style guide has said and perhaps there's some hidden inconsistencies in it. Um, so finally I'd like to uh, thank uh, a bunch of people, so my funders and then the uh, the Phillips, who have helped me in various uh, capacities throughout my career, um, and especially to everyone here at uh, CLSP, who's given me a place to come on Tuesdays uh, for the last three years. So I've learned a lot. So thank you. So are there any questions? Yeah. So, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, most of this is, is word, lattice, uh, word lattices. Yes. So, can you go even further and go subword and sure and syllable lattices? Um, yeah. So, so I mean, what I'm calling a word is uh, um, has no real has no real meaning. So, in some cases, the for example, what I was doing with Arabic. Uh, the units on those on those edges were were smaller than words. They were they were morphemes. Uh, and the task of translation, um, for most uh, language pairs, except for the most closely related, I would be skeptical that going smaller than a morpheme would ever make sense. But uh, um, but I think it's I think it's possible that uh, in, in some contexts, uh, you know, you might uh, you you really don't know what the right granularity is, and so you'd like to have a um, you'd like to be able to consider multiple ways of looking at the, the same problem. Can I ask a follow on to that? Mm -hmm. so, so the way you formulated it now, uh, you basically aligning a lattice to a string, um, would there be any advantage of trying to not posit that string on the other side and do a lattice to lattice? Um, yeah, you could, uh, you could imagine that there's some, uh, uh, that there's some really interesting uh, possibilities there. Um, I mean, to you know, one one thing off the bat is if you if you imagine you're putting something like uh, 
paraphrases into these lattices. You might, uh, you might actually imagine that you're learning correspond, <laughs> and you, you have paraphrase lattices in two different languages, and you're learning a lattice. You might actually learn alignments between phrases that aren't even present in the, uh, uh, you'd have to be using a phrasal alignment model, not one of these, uh, not one of these word-based things that I was, uh, that I was advocating. But uh, you could then learn phrase translations between correspondences that weren't even found in the parallel training data you had, which seems like it could be of, of real value, especially in sort of uh, rare data conditions. So yeah, I think, um, so to maybe anticipate a question, I am now putting the ambiguity on the other side. So there's no reason why I couldn't uh, eventually align. Uh, lattices to lattices. Um, <clears throat> did you? I'd like to copy down some of your math here so I can look at it now. Then if you go to where you first start using the script E in your. Oh yeah, sure. I can I can send these slides also as 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 well. Um, I mean, this is uh, this is not uh, these are not complicated probabilistic models. These are. These are about as simple as they uh, as they come, um, um, which is right where I like them. But uh, they're powerful. I mean, they you know you can the, you, the models actually learn some interesting things, and it's been a nice way to explore the relationships between uh, between these sets of lattices and their target strings. Yeah. So, uh, your idea of this uh, translation optimal segmentation uh -huh. is I'm trying to understand what are the what are the parameters of that? Is that given a fixed phrase table? Um, that constant, or do you, would you relearn a phrase table each, each way? Uh, well, so, so the, the basic idea that I'm, I didn't, uh, this is something I, I, I actually, tr I didn't want to specify too many characteristics of what I think the translation, so, so the intuition is that, um, for example, with word segmentation, we may have a style guide that tells us, we may have uh, linguistic intuitions that tell us, but really what we want to know is what are the right units of translation that I should learn from this parallel training data? Um, so when I'm building that phrase table, what are the, what are the right units so that when I then f find some test data and use the model induced from that, uh, f from that unannotated uh, segment, if so, so from the, basically where I don't know what the segmentation is, and then I, I'm confronted with a novel test sentence, what is the, uh, what are the right units that I've learned out of there? And so th my, my intuition is that uh, this optimal segment, so there will be an optimal segmentation, so if you go through and you just say what's the one that, uh, so what is the, what is the alignment, what's the gener, you know, how did I, what's the single best path that generates this sentence pair, that'll, that'll give you some alignment. Um, and my intuition is that uh, this will tend to be max, you know, you would expect that the best one would be maximally, would make maximum reuse, things would uh, decompose uh, as, uh, as much as possible. Um, so, so for example, if you could translate the, f uh, the phrase A, B to X, Y, but you could also translate A in isolation to X, you wouldn't bother to memorize A, B and translate it, 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 translate it to X, Y. You could, you could, you could find, uh, you could find a, smaller, uh, a smaller unit there. So you'd, you would expect to see a larger number of one-to-one -one alignments. And, uh, the the alignment models that I've I've favored are not uh, are not really going to get you very uh, very far along that uh, along that path because they themselves can only at most learn a one to many alignment, but they will they will still let you um, they will at least be able to recover from alignment errors that a particular segmenter may have made in a particular context. So as long, so imagine a case where you've got some, some crazy segmentation that your, that your segmenter produced and uh, you would like to be able to, uh, um, you would like to know what the best segmentation given this translation is. Or maybe it's ambiguous how you want to segment this string of 
characters, and it depends on the translation. You, you would expect if, if there is, so there are cases in Chinese where depending on the meaning of something, you would segment a phrase differently. And so in that case, you know, so by the optimal, tr translation optimal segmentation, I would mean the one that would correspond most closely to the meaning uh, in English in terms of these criteria of things like compositionality and favoring one-to-one -one alignments. Question English and Christmas again.